them to come up. Yeah. Okay, cool. So welcome everybody. I'm really excited to introduce today uh, today's speaker to you, Tanya Marie uh, Luhrmann. Uh, so Consciousness Club speakers usually Sorry. come from psychology or uh, philosophy of mind, but Tanya is a professor of anthropology at Stanford University. Uh, and I've been a big fan of her work ever since I got interested in perceptual reality monitoring, and I've been just totally fascinated by the things that she's looking at in her work. Um, so Tanya actually obtained her PhD in 1986 here in the UK from Cambridge University with a thesis, thesis titled Ritual, Ritual Magic, Magic and Witchcraft in Present Day England, which sounds absolutely fascinating. And then in 1989, she moved to the States to work at the University of Chicago. And since 20, uh, 2007, she has been uh, at Stanford University, where she has recently been named Albert Ray Lang Professor. And her work focuses on unusual perceptual experiences like hearing voices and how these are influenced by religious and cultural factors. She's the author of many books on this topic, such as When God Talks Back, Our Most Troubling Madness and How God Becomes Real. And today she's going to talk to us about voice and the mind. Tanya, the floor is yours. So it's a pleasure to be here. This is a remarkable book, a remarkable, remarkable group of people. Um, I can always already tell. And so uh, thank you for making the time to uh, listen to me. So I've al always been interested in the way that social worlds shape inner the texture of our inner experience and in what comes to feel real to people. Um, and I think that this teaches us something about the edges of human experience. It also teaches us something about the nature of consciousness. And today I'm gonna talk to us about uh, voices, these kind of remarkable, idiosyncratic, but I think quite important experiences. So a voice, oh, there we go. So a voice is, is the experience of being spoken to in the absence of a of human speaker. This is our rock star in the world of voice hearing, Joan of Arc. Um, these experiences, the more I talk to people about them, the more respect I have for the diversity and the complexity of these the, the, the event. But I would say that there are three features that define these kinds of events. The first is that the experience, the experience has a not me quality. So when I talk to people, the thing that people say again and again is that it didn't feel like me, it didn't sound like my voice, it wasn't, it, it wasn't mine. The second thing they say is that they it comes from outside uh, and it's sort of ambiguously um, some ambiguously located. People sometimes talk about hearing audibly in their mind. They say things like, I heard it with my, I, it was outside my mind, but I did not hear it with my ears. They, uh, they become, it's complicated sometimes for people to pinpoint exactly where the voice came from. It is true that some people are very clear that the experience was rooted in the mind and some people are very clear that they hear the voice the way that you're hearing my voice. The other quality of these experiences is that they're, it's not like listening to, to, to music. It feels as if there is a mind, a mind that is speaking to you with purpose and intention directed from the outside towards the, the, the person who hears. We're most familiar with these experiences in the condition of psychosis. So roughly more or less 1% of all people expect um, can be meet criteria to be diagnosed with what we call schizophrenia. Um, voices are found, 60 to 80% of folks with schizophrenia hear voices. Voices are found in other psychiatric conditions as well. When people with psychosis hear voices, psychosis being the large category for the, for the conditions, for many of the conditions in which people hear voices. Um, when persons with psychosis hear voices, the voice can kind of move in from the next room. It can emerge out of the leg. Uh, people can find themselves um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a beehive of harassing sound. But people hear voices in other conditions as well. Sorry. Uh, if you give people sort of a, a standard survey, many rates hover between 3% and 10%. 
when I sit with people and I talk with, when I sit particularly with charismatic Christians, people who seek to have an intimate relationship with God, roughly one in three tell, ha, tells me that they have had an experience of hearing God speak in a way that had a hearing quality, as if God spoke with an audible quality. I'm actually persuaded that these experiences are even more common than that. If you ask a little differently, if you ask with more detail, um, the rates can get up to sort of 50 to 70 percent uh, of people in the general population who will tell you that they've had at least one voice hearing quality that has had seems as if it has the quality of being heard. When people lose those whom they love, um, somewhere between 50 and 80 uh, percent in one study, 90 percent of people say that they have had an experience in which they have heard, seen, or felt the person that they have lost. And sometimes those, the, those experiences can help to create what feels to that person like an ongoing relationship with the person that they have lost. So these are idiosyncratic experiences. They are really important. They matter because they are evidence of spirit. Here, Gabriel speaks to Mary. That's why she can understand what he has come to explain. Yeah, uh, Abraham knew that Yahweh existed because Yahweh spoke to him. Mohammed heard Gabriel give him the book of the Quran. Jesus, the disciples knew that Jesus was was had returned from the dead because. They not only saw him like a ghost, but he spoke to them and had a relationship with him. These experiences have mattered in history. Augustine wanted desperately to become a Christian, found it difficult to do so. He described himself as torn against himself. He was visited by a friend, was a, emotionally moved by the conversation, ran into the backyard, threw himself at the, foot, at the foot of a fig tree, and he heard God speak, and that enabled him to take the step to bring him into Christianity. Joan of Arc, our, our, our rock star, uh, was a young peasant girl when she heard God speak to her, and he gave her such, con the, ex the experience gave her such confidence that she was able to go into the court of the King of France, persuade him to give her, give her an, ar uh, uh, an army, won the battle, and that, that, that win may have secured her kingdom. Closer at hand, Martin Luther King, um, well, in, in the sort of the early days, the Montgomery bus boycott was getting death threats. He was worried about his family. He didn't know whether to go forward. He, he says that he, uh, he writes, he wrote that he sat at his kitchen table and he prayed and he heard God say that he would be with him. And he continued. These experiences matter to ordinary humans. So this next, uh, next example is, is a woman who graduated from a pretty good university. Best job she could get was the morning shift at the, at the local 7-Eleven, a kind of lo local store that sells you know, food, food and sometimes gas. She, didn't, she did not much like it. And she said to me, one morning, this woman came in and she looked like she'd been up all night. She looked like it had been rough. She threw her stuff on the counter, two six packs of Miller Lite, some cat food and a food product of some sort, donuts, I think. And she looked at me and she said, hey, can you get me a carton of cigarettes? And I'm thinking, excellent. This is what I want to be doing with my life. So I turned around, rolled my eyes, and I started thinking my judgmental thoughts. And that moment, I literally heard the voice of God say to me, do not judge this woman. I have created her in my image and I love her. And poor woman, I almost fell over. I'm like trying to give her change. And I'm like, whoa, the voice of the voice of God spoke to me. I have been changed ever since. This next example is a woman in Chicago. Uh, and the experience is kind of irrelevant, but incredibly meaningful to her. It was pretty early on in my relationship with him. I just had wonderful devotions and worships. I just felt so close. I went out, it was the most God awful day. It was icy gray, rain and gray and cold and it was sleeting, but then he just graced me the rest of the morning. The bus showed up right away, which it never does. I was reading, I missed my stop to get off and I heard God say, get off the bus. 
I looked up and I hollered and the, and the bus actually stopped. I just felt that intimacy all morning, like when you go from holding a new boyfriend's hand to kissing him goodnight. So in my experience, the people who, the, the scientists who worry about these experiences more or less all agree that these, ex these experiences have their origin in something thought-like, which comes to be experienced as not me or, or not inside. Oops. Many, uh, or many scientists, some scientists, think that all of these experiences have their primary source in something like a continuum of psychosis. And the, the who knows what psychosis is? There are a lot of different theories, but there's some, but the but the general claim is that there's something deficit-like. And that you know, people who meet criteria for schizophrenia have a lot of it, and Augustine had a little. And somehow that is that is the that should direct the way that we think about these experiences. I have a different point of view. I think that uh, there's something more fundamental about the experience of thought itself uh, that gets skewed by madness. I mean, I think there really is a continuum of psychosis, but there's something that gets that. But I think that that psychosis is skewing something more basic about the relationship we have with our own minds. And I'm curious to hear how you will respond to what I have to say about this. So I come to this work with um, a long track record in thinking both about the anthropology of medicine and particularly about the anthropology of psychosis and schizophrenia and the anthropology of religion. The primary method that I use, I've added psychological methods to my toolkit, but the, my primary method is talking to people. I do what I, I call this comparative phenomenology. It's basically a clinical interviewing method. I try to really um, focus in on somebody's experience. Did you, did you feel you hear it? Did you hear it with your ears? Did you turn your head to see who was, spoo who was speaking? Where did, the, where did it come from? I uh, am seeking to hear, listen for novel experiences but I'm also trying to explore people against the background of other conversations I've had with people who, who have heard voices. Over the past few decades, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, um, some of them mad, some of them not mad, about these experiences. And I wanted to share with you three things that I, that I think I've learned. The first is that even with psychotic voices, voices that seem to many people to be like a thing of the body, a disease process that, that kind of happens, that there, there's something that kind of goes wrong in the brain. Even these bodily experiences are different in, so, in different social worlds. And so the first paper that I, I wrote about this was based on interviews with 20 people in the United States in Chennai, South India, in Accra, in West Africa. Um, I've now done many more interviews in those three settings when we've moved on to other areas uh, in Thailand, in Thailand, Shanghai, um, and Cape Coast. Uh, we've just written, published a paper in, um, in, in Eastern, uh, about voice hearing in Eastern Russia. But in this, in, in this first study, which I think is supported by, by, by the further interviews. We were interested primarily in whether the experiences were ever positive, whether people knew and whether people knew who was speaking, the kind of the content people gave to these experiences. One of the things I could see and that's held up in further interviews is that in California, in San Mateo, when people so people, everybody meets criteria for schizophrenia. Everybody is under hospital care. Um, in California, many more people report violent experiences. The voices, they have many more people hear violent commands and there's violent content to their experience. In Chennai, the dominant story is that people hear their kin. It's not everybody, but it's over half the sample. They know who is speaking. In general, it makes them, not always, but people 
you know, they get annoyed at their, at their kin. Their kin do what kin do. They tell them to clean up. They tell them to, you know, to, to, to wash themselves. They tell them to, to organize their room. It's kind of annoying. They tell them not to smoke, but it's their mom. They like to hear their mom. They like to, they like to have their mom present. In Chennai, when people describe their unpleasant experiences, those experiences not infrequently circle around sex and they circle around sexual shaming. So that the, the person who hears voices will say that they will experience themselves as walking into a public space and the voice will say, everybody here knows that you masturbate, something like that. In Accra, the dominant, um, dominant one, not everybody, but uh, at least half the sample talk about hearing God. And they say things like, they tell me to do the right thing. If I hadn't had the, the, this voice of God, I would have been dead long ago. They're in a psychiatric hospital. They say, God is the one who is, the voice of God is helping me to deal with the problem that landed me here. I think part of the story that I see here is a story about different cultural invitations to think about thinking. Um, so that in the United States, at least part of this story, apart from the violence of our culture, is that there's this kind of, I, I think that people imagine um, thought as incredibly important. It's who we are, it defines ourselves. Um, when we have probably a particularly strong boundary, between, imagine a particularly strong boundary between mind and world, I think people are frightened when it seems to break. In India, at least part of the story, is this, um, this cultural sense the interior of other people is highly salient, salient. In Ghana, at least part of the story is this deeply rooted cultural invitation to be aware of the thoughts of others as being quite as supernaturally dangerous, that you need some kind of protection. The second thing I see is that voices among the not obviously mad I think are associated with the ways that people pay attention to their thought. So one of the things that I've been doing recently is talking to elite athletes. Um, Stanford is, um, as many fine athletes, if Stanford were a country in the 2016 Olympics, we would have come seventh in the medal count for the different countries. So one young man, when I was giving a, a lecture said, you know what's, I have that experience too. And so I started to, to talk to athletes. And what they said is that they concentrate intensely on hearing what their coach has to say. Their coach is giving them commands. Um, sometimes their coach deliberately gives them words to say to fill their mind when they go out on the ice and there are 26 million people watching them. Sometimes the athlete just does this by themselves. But what they say is that the voice sometimes, um, it, well, what they say is that their coach's voice gives them better advice than they give themselves. They're sort of repeating what their coach says to them, but their coach, it, it, it's kind of easier when it comes from the coach. That the coach's voice sometimes pops out as audible. This happened to Timothy Gable during um, 2003 World Championship, I think. Um, when and, and they say something that's kind of intriguing, which is that when the coach's voice is effective, what they hear are little tags. Um, keep hold your arm here, slam the door. Track and so a track star said this to me. That's what she she tried to experience as she came around the, the came around the bend. When um, the athlete has stopped competing, and this is particularly true for for women, the voice can go bad. The, the, the athlete can hear their coach's voice, usually in their in their minds, um, saying general things like, you know, they're looking at, at, they're in the cafeteria and they think, they hear, you're fat, you're worthless, you're lazy, something like that. I've been talking to people without any metaphysical co commitments who um, create invisible friends. The, they call them, they sort of imagine this as coming from a, Tibetan practice. Uh, there are, but um, they call themselves toplomancers. They're trying to create a relationship with this invisible friend called a tulpa, 
They don't think that this tulpa is supernaturally present, um, but they experience themselves as as learning to to make the friend sentient. And there's something like in one of these sites, there are 30,000 usernames. Many of those usernames belong to the invisible friend, but it suggests that there are thousands and thousands of people who do this. We flew 25 of them out to Stanford, I and a young postdoctoral fellow, Michael Lifshitz, and we talked to them for four hours and then we tried to see if we could get a trace of their invisible friend in an fMRI machine. We don't have, we haven't finished the analysis of those data yet, but what we keep, but what the conversations are very clear. People do two kinds of practices. They cultivate their mental imagery. They try to see the tulpa. So this is somebody drew their tulpa. They try to see the ear. They really focus in on trying to see the ear in their mind, in their mind's eye or their nose or their boots. They really try to create the character. And they also talk to the tulpa as if the tulpa is there. They just, you know, talk to, talk to her as if she's present. Usually the voice isn't, isn't audible, sometimes it is. What they all say is that there is a learning period through which the tulpa comes to feel more and more real, and more and more not real, not not me, more and more not entirely inside. And they all talk about the tulpa as talking back autonomously, as if they don't define the way that the tulpa speaks. The example that I know best comes from charismatic Christians. Uh, these are people who want to be like that woman. They want to have an experience with God in which God is responding to them and they have a sense that God is there as their friend. So somewhere, when I wrote this book, it was about a quarter of, of, of uh, my country um, embraced some form of charismatic Christianity, might be a little less now. When you come into a church like this and you are not used to this, the, the, the experience of this kind of God, you have to learn a bunch of stuff. And the first thing that you learn is that your mind is not private, but that thoughts, images, and sensations you might have heard understood as self-generated are actually God speaking. You have to learn to pick out a thought in your mind that is not your thought, but God's thought. So this is a woman who... Um, describes this to me. She says, when people are praying over me and I'm just receiving it, and all of, I, all of a sudden I hear, go to Kansas, which is where her parents live. And she says, because I was debating whether to go to Kansas, I hadn't been thinking about it within a 24-hour period. And it's, it felt spontaneous. It felt a little bit like it wasn't hers. People learn to look for thoughts like that and to recognize them as being not their thoughts, but God's thoughts. People in a church like this do a lot of, spend a lot of time praying. They are praying with people, but they are also in their mind talking to God. And they're doing what the Talpa Mansers are doing. They are imagining God using their inner senses. They are sitting in Jesus's lap, going for a walk with Jesus, standing in the throne room, trying to feel the, the heat of his power on their cheeks. And people say again and again, just talk to God as if he's there, and soon you will come to experience him as talking back. People come to a church like this, and I know that many people come and say that they don't know how to do this. And after a few months, they say, I recognize God's voice the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. Mostly, this is not an audible experience. They say, you know, it's supposed to sound, you're supposed to, you know, pick God out of the flow of your ordinary thoughts. But sometimes it is. So this is that same woman who said, you know, the Lord spoke to me clearly in, in, in April, like May or April to start a school. And the anthropologist says, you heard, you heard this audibly? Yeah. Were you alone? Yeah, I was just praying. And she hears something and it feels audible to her. She never starts the school, but she does hear the voice. So I want to argue that there is a non-mad pathway, that there's some process of paying attention to inner events that leads to those events seeming to be more external and more in the world real. And I think 
we have we can say something about the structure of some kind of some common learning practices that you have to accept that the other can speak in your mind that you visualize that you audiate audiate you, you cultivate that inner imagery that you talk to the other as if the other is there um for the most part in the domains that i've been describing that are not psychotic voice these experiences people do in, say yes this is this is an external being it doesn't feel like me it has it has its own autonomy the audible component is rare when it is audible there the words four to six words and what the voice says is rarely mean and that of course is different from psychosis where the where the voice tends to be frequent it can have a whole lot of words and it's often quite mean also thinking speaking to what may be a, a secular audience i want to point out that what this gets you is something pretty great i don't look religion it's very complicated not always good for human society God can be terribly mean to people, but if you play your your cards right, people can experience this God as somebody who loves them, that they can interact with, that feels like the real social relationship. That's the it was the most important thing I learned from hanging around with charismatic Christians. And this is these are some of the places in which I wrote about that. I want to make a broader observation that I'm trying to wrap my mind around. I think that these experiences have something to do with the way that somebody relates to and thinks about their mind. The first thing I want to observe is that people who can become absorbed are more likely to have these experiences. Absorption is there. It's um, you measure it. We, we measure it with a 34 item scale. People say true or false. This sentence does or does not apply to me. And one of the things that I have seen again and again and again with secular and non-secular audiences is that the more truths somebody provides, the more they are likely to say that God feels like a person, the more they're likely to say they've heard God's voice, the more they're likely to say they've experienced a range of other unusual anomalous spiritual experiences. Um, I and Carol Weissman, who I often co-author with, think that there are two, that you can make an argument for, for two underlying factors of the absorption scale. One is um, an emphasis on mental imagery and a delight in inner mental experience. And the other is a willingness to suspend disbelief, to sort of play um, before you can worry about whether an experience is real or not. Second thing I want to say, no, the, sec the second big comment is that I don't think that the Cartesian model captures our experience of our minds, even in the secular West. And what I mean by this is that um, I think that in broadly speaking, humans have a kind of default set of expectations about thoughts, that they're located inside, that nobody else can see them, that we generate, that we generate our own thoughts and they don't leak into the world and cause stuff. But I want to point out that we all have conflicting intuitions about that, even if we don't believe those intuitions. So it's really easy to have the intuition that after a body is dead, something of their mind survives, something of their, their them, their thinking is still available. Really easy to have the intuition that people who love each other or know each other really well, like twins, if something terrible happens to one of them, the other one will know. We talk casually about a poem popping into the mind of a, of a poet. Um, we talk casually about, you know, you know, people so well, people sometimes curse somebody else, even if they don't believe that it works. But there's something about that intense anger that somehow feels intuitively able to kind of go out into the world and affects other people. I'm going to call all of that porosity, the idea that the mind world boundary is permeable in non-ordinary ways. And in the last 2016 to 19, I ran a large project. We were working in five parts of the world 
And we asked in a variety of ways about porosity. We did these rich open-ended interviews. We had people stand like at the equivalent and the equivalent go up to people who are online at the equivalent of the Department of Motor Vehicles um, and ask questions. And we gave lots of undergraduates um, survey questions, pen and paper survey questions. We gave people vignettes, supposing that it, there's a community and there's a woman like Martha and Martha, she realizes her neighbor, Mary, is really, really angry at her. Could Mary's anger hurt Martha? Supposing Mary's a special kind of person. Supposing Mary uses special kinds of words. Are there any other conditions under which, under which Mary's anger will affect Martha? We also created um, a scale. And the person who actually uh, came up with this was actually based in Ghana. And we used uh, comments that people generated in our conversations. You know, spirits can use thoughts and feelings to hurt people. Evil thoughts can go out into the world like Wi-Fi or radio and cause bad things to happen to other people without a, without a spirit's help. And we observed something striking, which is which was no matter where we went as a team, no matter how we asked the question, the more porosity somebody ascribed to or affirmed, the more voices and other experiences they, they reported, the more absorption, the more voices and other experiences they reported. And that's why we reported that there. And I talk about it here. Okay, so what I've said so far is that there is something like a proclivity, there's some kind of orientation towards the imagination, something like porosity, cult, which is, behaves more like a cultural invitation in, in our, statistic, our statistical analysis, some kind of elaborated cultural idea about what thought can do, and some story about practice um, in which people are sort of learning to treat their thoughts as other. And these, all of these seem to facilitate these experiences of voices. So now let me return to psychosis. So I think there is also a story here about whether training and practice can avert illness or mitigate illness. And the training, I think, is like the training that I've just described. Um, I actually also think that the person, probably the people who respond best, have, this, have the qualities of the people who are not mad, who are able to, uh, to experience these, these voices. But it's hard to be fully confident of that. So, as part of this large project, um, I spent some time in Ghana, where you find spiritual experts uh, who are called a Fu, and you see signs along the road like this. These are people who talk to the gods. Um, they are um, they they interact. They formally interact with these gods at shrines like this. These, this is a religious system like Voodoo, Candomblé, Bahia. You've got a kind of pyramid of spirits with a big spirit up at the top and sort of important spirits who are named. And then there are river spirits and tree spirits and dead people. And what happens is the Kung Fu is the person who becomes a traditionalist is called, usually in their late teens, early 20s, happens to be the time that many people fall ill with schizophrenia. Um, and when the person is called, it's sometimes often an auditory voice. Um, they, here it is, they are often an auditory voice that God calls out loud. The person is possessed by the God and they struggle. And people say that they're crazy, um, that, that, you know, they got to, you know, though that person is not, there's something wrong with that person. Um, there's a training part process. So if you become a train a, a kung fu, your mom will take you off to a master to whom you are become an apprentice. And people say that you have to learn to know the gods, to hear them better, 
to distinguish between the bad, the bad gods, the, the demons and the gods. Um, they practice getting possessed again and again, really a dissociative process, which has some relationship to absorption. Um, people say, if, if you don't accept the call, you'll go mad. And I met, I've met people in psychiatric hospitals who said, well, I didn't accept the call. I'm a Methodist. I don't, I don't go that way. So the team was in Ghana for eight months. Um, I'm the one taking the picture here. Um, we identified, we systematically um, interviewed, they systematically interviewed 40 Okomfu. Um, and I was struck by the fact that um, uh, only nine of these Okomfu actually said that they heard God speak out loud um, once a week or more often. So that was pretty striking. There are a lot of these people who were in the spiritual practice who do not hear God speak often. So I, I come in, I interview these people, interview a bunch more people as well like that. And I really try to uh, kind of try to figure out what it, what it feels like for them, for the God to speak. Um, and at the end of that experience, end of that interview, I played this track. And this was designed by Pat Deegan, psychologist who meets criteria for schizophrenia. We take 45 seconds of this, we translated it into Fante and we played it. And I'm gonna, we have enough time, so I'm gonna just play, I'm gonna see whether I can play it for you in English. Look at her eyes. Look at her. Her eyes are full of disgust. You smell. You are disgusting. They are looking at you and seeing you. They see everything you do. And you are disgusting. Where is this? Stop it. Stop it now. Don't touch that. Don't touch it. Okay, so a lot of shushing sounds, a kind voice, but a kind of mean voice as well. So, and these, these sharp commands. And I thought what I saw, or what I thought what I heard, is that some people, in a, and in, in general, the people who said, you know, ah, you know, God, God doesn't really speak out loud. God's not mean. There, there aren't a lot of demons. They listen to that track and they say, I've never heard anything like that. That's a convocation of witches. And the people who, but there were people who said, who, who had described to me already hearing God speak audibly a lot, saying that this, the demons, this, there, there were a lot of demons, but they didn't really, you know, they no longer worried about the demons. When they talked about their experience of being called, it really did sound as if they were psychotic. And they were more likely to say, yes. That's what the gods sound like. It's exactly what the gods sound like. But these people have not been hospitalized. You see more or less the same story in talking to people involved with spirit, um, spiritualism in London. So we talked to uh, 25 people more or less involved in spirit spiritualism in, in different kinds of ways. Um, and then I went and hung out with a group of people and watched, learned talk to people about how they learned to hear the dead. They gave a story of learning to hear the dead that was not so different from the Kung Fu and from the Christians. And in this group of 25 people, there were some people who, who were clearly like, oh, you know, they, 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 were, they, they, they came across a book on spiritualism. They thought it was really cool. They decided to learn how to, how to hear the dead and they love it. And there were other people who said, you know, I was hearing, I was hearing stuff. I learned that it was spirit, that, that these were the spirits of the dead because I read, read this book. And since I've become, since I've really gotten into this, um, it's, I, I feel like I, I'm more able to control my experiences. Both in these two domains, um, I think that it, so in both in a Kung Fu and the spirit mediums, there is some story about accepting that spirits can speak into the mind learning to do, do these this 
visualization and audiation, use cultivating your mental imagery and developing ideas about their um, about what these beings are like, and learning to talk to the spirit as if the spirit is there. And there are, I think there are different kinds of people who come into the group. And I think it's at least an invitation to wonder whether these practices change the experience of people who might struggle with psychosis. I think uh, this is at least part of the story. This this will take about 30 seconds. I just think it's fun. So I will play you something that, um, sat, well, many people say sounds like bird speech. This is a pretty sophisticated group. You might understand this already. So twittering, if I tell you that it's the first line of the Lord's Prayer, once you hear that, you will never be able to unhear it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So I think I think it's possible that people, okay, so I think it's possible that people are learning to interpret their experience differently and and, and making it feel at least a little kinder. This is resonant with some of the work in the hearing voices movement that you find in this most, so it's, it's, it's at, at its most um, present in the United, United Kingdom. These are, these are groups in which people, you know, this is a varied collection of people, but, uh, or very, it's a grassroots movement. People do a bunch of different things in these groups. But when I was taught about hearing the hearing voices movement, what people said they did is that they taught people who heard voices and who, and who were psychotic to name their voices, to respect their voices, and then to negotiate with their voices. They do something that the Akomfu do. They um, learn to attend to the positive voice to attend less to the negative, undesired, undesirable voice, they respect the voice. And possibly what's also going on is that the voices become social others within a social, social world. You're in some community and they behave more like social beings. Okay. So I just want to finish up. Um, so what should this teach us more generally? Uh, I think it's easy for, it was easy for me before I began this work to think of my mind as an infinite interior invisible universe with little, you know, memory and baskets like socks. You can dig into the basket and pull out, you know, pull out a piece of memory. I don't think that that way anymore. I think that our minds are more like dinner parties with noisy guests. I think we come to experience mind through ex through learning that others think differently. And we often carry others in our minds, either as shadows or as more vigorous presences. Um, I, I have come to think of the work of faith and the work of psychotherapy as a kind of management of these disruptive guests and a kind of sort of a, a, a way of turning them into responsible social others who are who you respect and are forced to respect you. Um, and I guess one of the questions for you is whether that's the advantage of consciousness. And that's, I know this is sort of a ridiculous question, but when, in the theory of mind world, um, often people argue that the that consciousness evolved in order to figure out what other people are thinking. And that is that protects you from predators, helps you negotiate a social world more, more effectively. But I have come through this work to begin to wonder whether um, one of the important things that consciousness does for us is to help us organize ourselves and respond to the inner voices in our own heads. So I will leave it there. And I am um, really interested to um, learn what you have to say. Awesome, thank you so much. Let's all unmute uh, to give Tanya a big round of applause. Thank you. Amazing.
Um, yeah, so we usually do questions via the raise hand function. I'm already seeing one hand up. Uh, Sultan, do you want to kick us off? Thanks for that. Um, very interesting. 